All right, and we're live. Welcome everybody to this edition of this uh, month's alumni master session. My name is Mike Supervici, for those of you that don't know me, and I run the alumni success group here at the Founder Institute, and our role is to help you grow in any way that we can. Uh, sometimes we do that through structured programs like Funding Lab, uh, Product uh, Market Fit Lab, and so on. Other times uh, we do it through one-on-one -on -one advice, and other times we do it through these alumni master sessions, which we do every single um, you know, month where we bring in an expert to talk to us about a very, very important topic. Um, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you see there on your right hand side, there's a chat room. And um, if this is your first time attending one of these master sessions, what we want to do with these is that we want to make them highly interactive because they're for you. And, you know, we bring in an expert and we want you to ask questions. So if there's any sort of questions that come up either during the talk or after the talk, please feel free to add them in the chat room. What I will do is I will make sure that, uh, you know, I relay all those questions over uh, over to to Kevin. And then, you know, we can go ahead and, 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 and go from there. Um, that being said, it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin, uh, who uh, is uh, will tell you a lot, a lot about how to basically become a category leader, how to think about all this. And, you know, I would love to just turn it over to you at this point, Kevin. Uh, maybe you can introduce yourself and then we can get started with the presentation. Sure. Um, yeah, appreciate that, Mike. And hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Kevin Maney. Uh, it's, it's possible that some of you have run into my work before. I'm a, I'm a journalist and author uh, or have been for 25, 30 years in this technology space for USA Today and Fortune and Wired and uh and pretty much anybody newsweek everybody else you can think of and wrote up uh, written about a bunch of books and what we're going to talk about today is what came out of um, a book that came out in 2016 called play bigger in which we um, proposed and and uh, uh and wrote about this idea of category design and um and what's happened in my career since then is the book came out and uh it's been such a hot commodity around the tech startup world that um, it's turned into a business for me. Uh, actually, most of what I do now is go around advising companies based on what we wrote in the book. So I guess the idea today is to tell you the basics about what that's all about. That's Should great. Get going, Mike? That's great. And it looks like I see Mike Dampaus as well. He's also just oh, uh, joining us live as well. Uh, Mike is also uh, uh, works with Kevin on this, uh, which is great. Hey, Mike. Hey guys, sorry about the delay. I had technical difficulties. No problem. We're just introducing ourselves anyway. So if it's actually your turn. So if you want to go ahead and, and introduce yourself as well, it'd be great for the audience here. Yeah, I'm Mike Damphouse, one of the partners at Category Design Advisors. Um, I've got probably, I don't know, 20, 30 years of CEO, CMO track record um, with some hits and some misses. Um, and I've been part of the Play Bigger family. Um, since about, I don't know, 1999, when I hired Dave Peterson, one of the co-authors, uh, to be, uh, to head up my marketing team when I had a uh, startup back in the 90s. And then when the book came out, Dave called and said, hey, Damp, can you partner with, uh, with Kevin and put together something um, on the East Coast? So that's kind of what we did. And right now, the East Coast, West Coast thing doesn't even matter. We've been all over the world. We're doing projects in from Israel to Singapore and all over the U.S. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, uh, everyone, before Kevin gets started, uh, I've already started posting some things in the chat room. If you have questions, say hello, whatever, add them into the chat room on your right. We're gonna be relaying these questions over to Kevin and to Mike as, uh, as, as the presentation is, is going on. So Kevin, I'll, I'll, let, I'll, I'll let you take it from here. All right, so let me get the uh, uh, screen share on. Yep, we see your screen. Excellent. All right, I'm going to go back there. And then you want to just uh, go ahead and and, and uh, make it full screen, and then we should be ready to go. Yep. Very nice. We're in. Excellent. We're in, but we don't have Kevin. But we'll have to we'll have to live without Kevin today. All right, 
so everybody, sorry for the technical difficulties, um, but if you were here since the top of the hour, you'll know that Kevin Maney, who is one of the co-authors of Play Bigger, um, is logged in, but is having some technical difficulties. So I'm Mike Damphouse, I'm Kevin's partner, and we're going to talk today about category design and, uh, and hopefully bring Founders Institute uh, some value. So what do we mean by the word category? Basically, category is about uh, innovation in certain contexts and finding what's missing. If you look back in history, there have been category designers since marketing had started, since companies had started, since people were trying to go to market. One of the best examples, and it's in the book, is Clarence Birdseye. Clarence Birdseye was studying uh, wildlife in the Arctic when he found that he saw the, the locals, the Inuits, catching fish out of, the, out of the ocean and throwing them on the ice. And it was so cold that the fish were flash freezing. And they would then take, take the fish and stack them like logs. And what he realized was that they were solving a problem of not being able to fish all winter by flash freezing fish and being able to have fish throughout the winter. And he thought, could I build, could I build um, a system to do this with food in the, in the U.S.? He was from New York. So he came up with the idea and started experimenting with flash freezing vegetables. And he realized that the problem that we all had that we didn't know we had, which was if you wanted vegetables in the winter, you had to eat them out of a canning jar, was basically could be solved with a frozen foods industry. So he created the freezers. He created the, the whole ecosystem, the trucks that delivered frozen food from the factory to the stores. He created the freezer displays for the stores. So Clarence Birdseye saw a problem, identified that problem, and realized that if he could solve it, he would have a new category of business, which today is frozen foods. So how do categories work? This is a book by Paul Gorosky, um, who studied um, markets and how they evolve. He was an economist. And essentially, he, he defined, decided that, or found that most categories are set up in a way where they start to define themselves as a natural life cycle. And as the categories start to define themselves, there are multiple vendors that emerge. Somebody comes up with the idea, there are a handful of copycats, and the market starts to, to define itself. As it starts to mature over time, the market starts to become developed, the vendors start to drop off, and a leader, or a handful of leaders, but typically a, a large leader, starts to um, take, take hold. That um, category, once it's defined, is a chosen category that people now start to, to see. The market then starts to grow in value. And as the market grows in value, that category starts to take take effect. It's it's in the develop phase. And then when it finally reaches a point of being a dominant category, it's in the dominate phase. That dominant design chosen is in the beginning evolving into that market cap area. And together, you'll start to see the market cap takes off and the number of vendors drops off. So why do categories work that way? It comes down to brain science. Basically, between brain science and computer science, um, the book, Two Second Advantage, um, it's a great book, you should pick it up if you can, talks about cognitive biases. And cognitive biases are how we make decisions and how we store things. So we love categories. Our brains 
are full of lots of information. All day long, we're surrounded by activities. We pick up new information. We need to store that information. We store things in categories. As you see here, this is a frozen food aisle. The frozen food aisle is easy. When I walk into a store, I walk in saying, I need frozen peas. I don't walk in thinking I want bird's eye frozen peas. I walk in thinking frozen peas, and I walk to the frozen food aisle. I find the, the door or doors that have peas behind it, and I see the generic ones, and I probably see the bird's eye ones. And the way my brain is, is functioning, I've got a bias towards bird's eye because it's the first brand that I associated with frozen foods. Categories are also line items on budgets. If you can create a category that becomes a line item on a budget, then you've certainly made yourself a, a category king. Because people think in, in large buckets, people want to put storage, put their, people want to put their, their thoughts in storage in areas that are easy to get to. Steve Jobs, he, he used one of the um, classic um, cognitive biases called the anchoring effect. Anchoring effect is when um, something first comes to you and it's the first time you've heard it, you anchor that in position. So when I first heard of a smartphone, still remember this, it was I think 2007 or eight, I was out at a buddy's in California and he said, hey, look, I just got the iPhone. That was an anchoring effect. It was the first time I heard of it. <laughs> then you've got groupthink. Cognitive bias of groupthink is that all my friends started to buy iPhones. And I said, damn, I want to get myself an iPhone. So that created more cognitive bias for the category. And then choice supportive. I've bought Macs and iPhones for I don't know how long now. And today, I am an Apple junkie. And so the smartphone established that category of smartphones. My friends influenced me to buy it. I wanted to be like them. And then now, I think I've had every iPhone model that's come out, uh, except for one, maybe the six I skipped. But Steve Jobs created the category, established it, and I will probably continue buying Apple iPhones uh, as long as I can imagine. So category design is a way to take advantage of the way our brains work. You look for what's missing. Manoj um, Bhargava, the founder of 5R Energy, he had a really interesting thing. He, he saw that people don't want necessarily to have a drink when they need energy, they just need energy. So he came up with the energy shot, and the energy shot was a you know a flavored, one mouthful drop it down boost of energy and vitamins. That he realized, I don't want to sell this in the drink category. I don't want to be in the coolers. I want to be out by the cash register in a little shot bottle. And so he came up with the energy shot, and today it's a five billion dollar category. But you want to think different, not just better. Don't think like a product designer. Don't think like a spec sheet. If you want to say I'm shinier, brighter, and faster, you're probably saying the wrong things. Lee Iacocca. Now, this goes back, back uh, almost 30 years now. But he realized that families need more than just a station wagon. Families need something bigger, they need something more comfortable, something they can walk in and out of instead of crunching to get in, something that they can put groceries in and the key, the kids. But he also needed something that wasn't a, as big as a van because it wouldn't fit into garages the way houses were built. So they came up with the, the minivan. And they introduced the minivan under multiple brands there was the Plymouth Voyager, there was the Dodge Caravan, 
And essentially, it's not the brand that introduced the category. It was Lee Iacocca calling it the minivan and telling people why they had a problem, a problem they didn't know they had, and solving it. So you show us that problem that we didn't know we had or didn't think we could solve, and that's a category. Here's a client we worked on recently, a company called Ripples. They're in Israel. What they decided one day, it was interesting, the two founders were um, sitting there looking at a coffee, and one of them, who's a product designer, was looking at that coffee and said, everyone looks at their coffee when they get it. They look at the foam. What if there was a message there, something we could take advantage of? And we came up with the category BevTop Media. Basically, the problem is that you had a gap. There was this coffee being presented to you with foam, and everyone looks. Same thing with the Guinness beer. You're handed the beer. There's this beautiful layer of foam on it. What if we could take advantage of that? And we took advantage of that by they created a printer that prints on top of foam top drinks. So their category, BevTop Media, is solving the naked drink gap. If you see <clears throat> a problem, and VCs, we, we coined this from, took this from uh, VC friends of ours. If you see a problem that no one knows they have, that's the very best kind. It's a zero billion dollar market. If nobody's already charging after it, and you see that there's potential, it's a zero billion dollar market. It's a problem that nobody knew they had that you can solve. This is a picture of Kevin um, with Jeff Bezos. Kevin was um, at a conference, and Amazon was about to launch uh, what we all know today as Amazon Web Services. And Jeff reached out to Kevin and said, hey, could you meet me um, in my hotel room? I, I want to discuss something. And basically, Kevin went up there, and Jeff said, we're about to launch this thing, the and I can't remember the exact term it was called, but the uh, something elastic cloud. Um, and Kevin, you know, his eyes went up, and Jeff said, I need to describe it in a way that's much clearer than the way I'm describing it. And Kevin basically, um, having known him for years, started talking to him and listening, and he, you know, listened to identify the problem and then tried to come up with a very simple way to, to describe it. And together, they put together um, a new point of view of how to talk about the product, and they realized that it was web services, which we know today. And Amazon Web Services is simple enough. It's a category, and now cloud computing is definitely a category that, um, that Amazon is now dominating. If you see a problem and you think it's a category, think about what we call the adjacent possible. This is a concept that came from Steve Johnson's book, Where Good Ideas Come From. Essentially, the adjacent possible, if you look at this chart, on one side we have technology, on the other we've got society and what society is willing to accept. If you think about the television, it's in the green section. Society is totally willing to accept that. My parents, 79 years old, they know how to use a, t a television. As you approach that white barrier, you start to get to the point on the other side where ideas become technologically advanced, but society has not quite embraced it yet. Right over that line, like for instance, virtual reality, that is a new category. That's something that's emerged that you've identified that people are ready to embrace but not quite there yet. It's your job to create the category and cause them to embrace it. Teleportation way off on the right, too far away. Society won't embrace it, not yet. If you launch the teleportation category today, everybody would just look at it and they wouldn't start to invest their consumer dollars in it. 
and it probably wouldn't take hold as a category. But virtual reality today, that's something people can see. They're willing to take hold. So category design is a whole company strategy based on how our brains work. Remember the cognitive biases. Every category today or every company today always has a product. They got a great product idea, they've defined it, they've developed it, and they build a good company. They design their company culture. They have healthy snacks in the break room. They have book club, whatever it may be. But product design and company design alone doesn't stand unless you've got a category strategy. And category kings, when they come into the market with all three of those, that category strategy is the foundation of how they bring that product and their company to market. So the impact of winning a category, market share. Category kings take market share. The study that we did um, that shows this shows that 75% of a category economics will be taken by the company that first launched, introduced, and, and educated the category. You could measure it by total market usage. Dropbox versus Google Drive. You can also measure a category king or identify a category king because of how people want to work there. There's a study that was being done by Susie Welch, who's the wife of Jack Welch, the uh, ex-CEO of, of General Electric. Um, Jack was actually given a copy of the book Play Bigger by Jeff Bezos, and Jack gave it to his wife, Susie, who's a journalist, um, and she was doing a study with LinkedIn to be presented on uh, CNBC about how people are attracted to work at certain companies. And she had just read the book, and she starts doing this study uh, with Dan Roth and realizes that most of, um, most of the companies that were the most attracted attractive companies to work for were category kings. So she reached out to, to Al Ramadan, one of the co-authors, and wanted to talk to him about it. And together they realized that, yeah, when you're a category king, you're a more attractive company to work for. And it attracts talent, which we all know today is a challenge. So some of the companies we've worked with, um, everywhere from TaskRabbit, consumer companies, uh, Ripples, the you know the the company that printed on the on the coffee foam, um, TechStars is an incubator like you guys, like like Founders Institute. Um, most of these companies, are many are tech tech based, um, but both consumer and B two B. So with that, um, quick overview of category design, and now we can turn towards questions. And and I don't know if Kevin is back on yet. Um, or if he uh, is still technologically uh, shut shut off there, um, I think we're. I think he's not gonna. He's not on on the on the on the webinar, but that's okay um, because uh, we wanted to ensure that we have plenty of time to go and, and cover some some questions here. So everyone in the chat room, this is a really good opportunity for you to kind of ask questions about this and how to think about category design. So maybe I can start. So. You know, um, at what point um, should founders start thinking about category design uh, in, in, you know, in their business process? Well, many people think that, um, you know, you really have to have your business baked and your product baked uh, to jump into category design. But the real answer is you should start thinking about it from day one. Um, the reason for that, if you remember the... Um, the, the triangle, product design, company design, and category design. If you build your category strategy into your company from day one, then you're going to have it in all aspects of the business. You're going to have it in uh, category thinking as the developers are writing code, category thinking when marketers are putting messages together, category thinking when you're recruiting people. You know, we have a client... They have their recruits 
always read Play Bigger before their first interview. And they do it because they want people to come in and be, you know, um, basically, you know, joining, joining the club in a way that they all have the same shared goals. So don't think that you're too early um, and do it. You know, if you, if you have a category that could be had, start to think about category strategy early and often. Uh, Mewul has a really good question here in the chat room. Hey, Mewul, uh, can, can a company become a category king without funding? Certainly. Um, funding is important, but funding is not everything. Um, in, you know, it's, it's easy to say that when I'm not struggling to launch a company. Um, but, you know, I've been there. And if you, if you can put together um, your, your strategy and get it to market and do it in a way that's category oriented, meaning market the problem, market the ramifications of not solving the problem, and introduce your category as the solution to that problem. That's category thinking. And if you can do that, you can do it in an intimate, low budget way. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a company that uh, worked with the, the guys that play bigger, um, the, the other co-authors of the book. Um, there's a company that was targeting the shipping industry, uh, the container shipping uh, on boats. You see those big containers. And think about that industry for a minute. There's a lot of ships in the world, but they're really controlled by a handful of shipping companies. And so they were basically trying to figure out how do we do a lightning strike or a launch to that, to that market in a way that can capture, you know, those handful of shipping companies. So instead of spending millions of dollars and, and, you know, Wall Street Journal ads and trade show takeovers. They did an intimate um, uh, lunch, uh, discussion and lunch uh, at an event where all these shipping companies were already there. So they got the invites to the right people. They had those companies in a room. They did an educated uh, luncheon and they had buyers. So don't think you need to spend millions of dollars to go, to bring a category to market. You can do it in in very simple, um, in simple ways. Carolyn asked, uh, well, it's more like a a statement asking for your advice here. Um, it's a tricky balance, you know. What people know equals easy to get started. Uh, with you know, a totally new category that no one's heard of equals really difficult, but can dominate. Uh, any advice there? Uh, <clears throat> it's funny. It categories don't have to be simple. They don't have to be complex. Categories just simply have to be a container that your solution is is solving for people. The container is where the problem exists, right? It's a hole. It's a nagging pain. The solution is the category, and the category should be what I kind of call it a universal truth. A universal truth is you look outside and there's a blue sky and you say to somebody, that's a blue sky. Nobody can argue with that. If you look at something and say, that's a category like customer relationship management. Yeah, that's a category. Everybody needs to store data on their customers and track the relationship. It's a universal truth. So whether it's complex or simple, that ripples, right? printing on top of drinks and putting ads on, to, on the foam of your, your Guinness, now that you see it, you realize that that's an opportunity, right? Problems can present opportunity. And so it's very simple. Let's print on top of a drink. But it's a category that's taken off in a crazy way. Isabel asked the question, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the lightning strike? Yes. So once you have um, defined your category and you've defined what we call a point of view, a point of view is the way you tell your story. Um, and it's done in an emotional way. It's, it's uh, typically when we produce points of view for people, um, it's 600 to 800 words. It's written 
to a story like you're talking to your most common, uh, most important persona, um, and you tell the story in a way that's emotional. You start with the problem, you illustrate the the pain of not solving the problem, and you're going for the gut. And when you go for the gut, and then you turn around and embrace them with the solution and the category, then you're you're starting to um, appeal to the logic. And you tell the story of your category in a way that doesn't talk about your brand or your category uh, in specifications or shinier, brighter. You're talking about it in, in really emotional, wholesome ways. But when you do that, you now have a different way to talk to the market. And that's where lightning strikes come in. What a lightning strike is, is when you've defined your category and you need to now bring it to the world, you need to do it two ways, both internally in your own company and ecosystem. And you can do that through all sorts of ways, you know, hey, we're launching this new product, you know, next month, everyone, we've got t-shirts, we've got, you know, um, speakers, whatever you do internally to ramp up and prepare for the category launch, what we call lightning strike. And the lightning strike when we go public is it's that one moment in time where you concentrate all your energies on on the category message. And what you're really doing is you're trying to deliver that point of view in multiple ways. Could be simple ways like a, um, you know, a, a billboard sign or um, in the case of TaskRabbit last year, they, they took over all the subway um, posters. They had TaskRabbit posters everywhere. Um, it could be in a simple way. Uh, we had a client that launched um, at HR Tech a couple of years ago, and they just did the coffee sponsorship. It's the cheapest sponsorship available at a large event, but everybody walking around the event had a coffee cup in their hand that had their category on it, time intelligence. Um, so lightning strikes are meant to be compelling. Um, they don't have to be big budget like we talked about earlier. You know, they don't have to be Wall Street Journal and hijack a trade show. They could be um, the intimate dinner or lunch. Um, it could be as simple as uh, we had a client this week that did a strike. It was as simple as a press release. Um, I think it was, you know, $1,200 on PR Newswire. They got picked up by 10 um, earned media placements. Uh, and I think eight, 800, I think, um, actual unearned media pickups where, you know, they just re people, media sites reprint your press release. So it can be that simple, but lightning strikes should have a purpose. Make sure that your purpose is understood. If your purpose is to introduce the category, then introduce the category. Don't talk about how many bits and bytes your, your software saves you. Um, talk about the problem and the solution. Um, if you're introducing a, uh, you know, a new partnership to your ecosystem, Talk about why the, the ecosystem had a problem. Always focus on the problem and then talk about how your category solves it. Tori from uh, Andiotics is asking a question here. So we're trying to create the category of a tiny pill robot surgeons in the human body to have a, a passing resemblance to a passive pill camp. But to us, we see a massive new market as we change the nature of uh, surgical intervention. What might be some good strategies to show people the big opportunity without getting pigeonholed? That's a big question. Um, <clears throat> I think th I think that comes down to, or comes back to the discussion on point of view. Getting your story to a point where you can talk about, um, and I don't know your technologies, um, or, or the terminology in, in your industry well enough to articulate this, but to be able to tell the story of these, and I'll just call them surgical bots, I don't know what you call them, um, but to be able to tell that story in a way that you can convey in 600 words, you know, a three-minute story, people people call them elevator pitches. I don't know about you, but I've never I've never given my story in an elevator. Think of it as um, a bar stool story, right? 
if you're sitting there and you ordered um, a drink and the person next to you is working on their computer and drinking a beer and you look over and you saw something that you could address like they had a slide up that was uh, and, and this is I know this would n never occur with surgical microbots, whatever they are. But you look over and you say, hey, let me tell you what I do that could solve that problem. And you talk in a way like you have a martini in your hand. That's the story you want to talk with. Keep it simple. Start with the problem. Acknowledge that you know the person's problem, your persona. Once you can identify and articulate the problem and get people to acknowledge their problem, then talk about the solution. And the solution is your category. And in the case of, and, and again, not knowing the terminology, you know, microsurgical bots, there's your category. You introduce it, and then you start talking about it and what it does for people. What does it solve for them? And that's what that's what a point of view does. And I think simplifying your story to be at that bar stool level is what makes it um, makes it easy to digest. Jerome asked a question: um, How to communicate basically around? Maybe I'm going to have to elaborate on this, Jerome, because it's a, it's a little unclear. So. You know, can you talk about some best practices on how to communicate and get funding for a new category? Uh, he says it's, it sounds uh, extra difficult uh, and to, you know, get metrics about like something new, you know, uh, serviceable, addressable market, total addressable market. You know, how, any, any advice on how to best, uh, ed, uh, how to educate people on this? Yeah, actually, investors love new categories, so don't shy away from it. Think of it as, in, in fact, if you're presenting your um, new business ideas to investors and you're comparing yourselves to other markets, they're probably thinking, ah, oh, they're just coming up with a bigger, better, brighter. If you present your idea as a totally new category, remember the zero billion dollar market? In your question, you asked about TAM, right? What's the total addressable market? Put a slide up that has a dollar sign, a zero, and a B. Zero billion dollar market. Tell that story to your investors. Tell them that, yeah, there might be five other companies doing this, this, and that, but this is a new category. This is a new way to do it. This, this category doesn't exist right now. So they say, what's the total addressable market? You say, it doesn't exist right now. It's a zero billion dollar market. It's unlimited. You, if we create the market, they will come. So don't be afraid to introduce new categories. In fact, I know um, one of the good VCs, friends of, friends of the Play Bigger team um, out in California, He, when he hears the, a pitch, and people don't even think category design, but if he hears a pitch and they say something like, it's new or this is different, or nobody else is doing this, it's a category. He puts it right in the category bucket, and he invests in category winners. Uh, Carolyn asks about time intelligence. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so Replicon, uh, a client of ours, was uh, kind of interesting, 12-year-old company, I think, uh, when we first started working with them. And they were, um, they created, uh, or were selling basically time tracking software, kind of a, you know, old school industry, um, you know, where, who checks in to work at what time, um, what project did they work on at what time, um, you know, competing with time clocks and other software applications. But what they did is they started to add um, analytical tools to the time tracking software and applied some machine learning and realized that there is so much value that time brings to a business and that businesses weren't trying to address. You know, a company's biggest asset is their people. And the people are spending time all day doing things. So they introduced the category time intelligence, which starts to treat time as an asset. And they launched that category at uh, HR Tech a couple of years ago. That was the coffee um, coffee cup sponsorship. And it was, it was very successful to the point where 
and this is something you want to you want to always look out for. An analyst was talking to them and said, you know, everything at the show is exciting this year. There's a bunch of new things, but there's something about this time intelligence where I I actually feel like I understand what it is you're solving for me. And when you can get an analyst to use the word feel and identify a problem and then use your language, when an analyst starts to use the category name, you know you're on the wrong, you're on the right path. So time intelligence is 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 that, and they're competing today in a in a billion dollar market, and people look at it as something fresh and new. Um, another question here from uh, Ricardo. Hey, Ricardo. So again, along the same concept, you know, what is the best way to introduce a a category that investors, users are not familiar with. For example, our startup, Paid Exposure, is building a marketplace that empowers anyone to get paid for promoting uh, for, for promoting sponsors uh, looking for any kind of online, offline exposure. We tend to associate ourselves in the influencer uh, category because that's the familiar, popular term. Do we develop an exposure category, uh, question mark? Uh, we're attempting to do that by referring to influencers uh, as promoters. What would you suggest? It's a very common, <clears throat> really good question. It's a very common um, situation for a lot of our, our clients. And, um, you know, you end up in situations where you have master categories and subcategories or you have a category point of view to talk to one persona or in a category po point of view that talks to another persona. And it's, it's very common. So you just need to try to deal with it. Um, if you've got multiple personas that have truly different problems that you're solving, but you're solving with the same category, then talk differently to them. Um, when you put your main point of view together and think of your point of view as, it's the CEO's TED talk, right? It's the three to four minutes of here's the story of who we are. Put together your main point of view, talk to your biggest persona. And when I say biggest, I mean, who's gonna write the check for, to buy your software, whatever it may be. You know, the most obvious persona is the CEO. CEO of, you know, uh, companies of XYZ size. That's your persona, talk to them. But if you have sub-personas, maybe it's the head of their HR department, maybe it's the CFO within the company, then talk different points of view, create sub-stories. Um, and you know, as far as the categories are concerned, you wanna try to keep the categories together so that you have one category that people associate you with but it's okay to introduce some other, if you want to call it subcategories, things that can resonate better with the HR department, for instance, as opposed to the CFO. I don't know if that answered it, but it, it, it's a, a very, that's a very deep dive discussion that typically takes place and it could be a whole day deep dive. I've seen it happen. Um. N Nisar, sorry if I, I, I mispronounced your name here, uh, is asking, you know, can you sp speak a bit more about mapping the ecosystem um, a blueprint uh, and any strategies for bringing in some of these ecosystem players to help validate the category or your story? Yeah, in, very good question. You hit on one of the top benefits of an ecosystem. So an ecosystem can validate your category. And if you design it right, it's gonna be there to support you on day one. So let's say that you've got um, an offering that has um, integrated partners. So maybe you're, you're, you've got an app that interfaces through an API to, um, to Google Maps. I don't know, something simple. Um, your ecosystem is now your app. It's the people that use your app, and there's the Google Maps interface to, to your app. So your ecosystem is involving multiple things. If you can do that, especially with ecosystem partners that can bring value to you, it totally endorses your category. 
So ecosystem partners are not only there to help enable you solve the problem, but they can enable you to validate the problem as well in the category. Um, an ecosystem doesn't have to be as complex as um, you know, formal relationships with companies. It could be the ecosystem of, um, you know, think of, of uh, Uber. The ecosystem is drivers. The ecosystem is people that need rides. The ecosystem is restaurants that want to deliver their food. The ecosystem is, uh, unfortunately, the taxi drivers that are, you know, that are giving away their business. So that whole ecosystem is very complex, but it's also very simple when you map it out. He mentioned also um, Blueprint. Um, some people think ecosystem and Blueprint kind of blend together, and they can. Um, but your Blueprint, when you think of a category Blueprint, think of it as sort of the, um, the whiteboard description, visual description of what your category is. So think of it as, you know, um, a, a map or a diagram, a flow, something that can visually articulate the category, the problem you're solving and what the category is and how it solves. And if you can do it in a visual manner, that's, that's the, the blueprint. Um, the book has a couple examples in it. Play Bigger has a couple examples of blueprints in it. Uh, there's a question here in the chat room from Dustin. Is there a way that entrepreneurs in an emerging field, for example, chatbots, they use, chatbots, they use natural language, AI learning, can best think about their role uh, in this new category's life cycle? Uh, <coughs> certainly. I mean, you know, everybody, everyone's role, if you're creating a category, everyone in your company should be considered a category designer. Get everyone in your company to read the book, Play Bigger. And I, and I don't mean that lightly. I don't know. Um, we did, we did just this week, um, company that just raised, I think about a hundred million, um, in like a ERF round. Uh, they have a book club and they decided the CEO had read Play Bigger and thought, yeah, this is awesome. I want the, I want my whole company to think like this. So he bought the book for all, I think it was 120 employees. And everybody read the book, and then they had a book club on Wednesday, um, and, and Kevin was there. And what what's interesting is that every person in that company, and it's a large company, they advertise on on television. They they you know you see them on your Facebook feed everywhere. I, I can't disclose who they are, but my point is that everyone in that in that company had a role, whether it's you know, the, the person writing the marketing copy to the product designer that's thinking, you know, how am I solving someone's problem in a different manner? Or if it was the salesperson, how they're talking to people. Everyone had a role from the CEO downward. So um, I don't know if that addresses the question, but, you know, bringing a category to market, it takes, it takes a village. A uh, question here from 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 Judy. Um, we are in a category that isn't well known yet. Executive social, uh, in quotes. How can we publicize the category? Or any well, advice or thoughts on that? Yeah, that. So that's obviously a um, an open ended question uh, with a million answers. Um, how do how do you publicize it? You you know it's it's comes down to you know the, the 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 typical question of we have this great thing we want to go um, you know introduce it and dominate the market. Well, think about what it is you're trying to actually achieve. Um, the cognitive bias issues uh, in the in the book we talk about the, there's three cognitive biases that really um, impact category thinking, and if you think about which one you want to dial up for the purpose of what you're trying to do, it, it can influence the ideas that you might come up with for a strike. So idea, you said executive social, I think was the category in air quotes. Um, you said that it, most people don't know it exists yet. So what is it you wanna do? You, you want to 
introduce it to people so that everyone knows it exists? Or do you want to get it to some influencers to get them to adopt it and maybe start to influence others that it exists? You make those decisions and you say, okay, one is a mass market um, lightning strike, right? You'd have to get to tens of thousands of executives to go one way. So that's broad awareness. But the other one, which is um, thought leadership awareness, might only require you know, dominating a conference of CEOs that's taking place um, in the next month. And you've got 100 CEOs that get together once a year. Um, I'm thinking like, um, you know, one of those events where there's CEO thought leadership. You hijack it, you get 100 people to know who you are, and those 100 people are thought leaders um, and get them to influence. So don't don't always restrict your go-to-market thinking um, based on budget or magnitude, think creatively. What is it you're trying to achieve? If you were truly trying to get people to, you know, tens of thousands of people to um, adopt your idea and un understand your category, that's going to be a heck of a lot bigger thinking and and budget execution than it would be if you're if you're simply trying to get a hundred people in a room to know you exist. So uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour, everyone here. Um, so um, final, please add your final question. We're, we're trying to get to as many of them as we can here in the next few minutes. Um, Luciano asks a question, back to the ecosystem question. So we're an early stage startup in the aviation travel industry building ways for lines. Uh, it's, a, it's an app. Uh, the market is very fragmented and we're considering propo uh, proposing with many other startups to launch aviation travel startup ecosystem where we agree to co-market each other. What are your thoughts on doing this as a category builder? Yeah, co-marketing or taking a whole uh, ecosystem um, to, a, to a category together is, is great thinking. Um, if you get, when you build a category, for instance, when we work on a category project, there's always someone in the room that says, throw a trademark symbol on that category name. Well, that's the last thing you want to do. You want to get everybody talking your your category. You want people using it like it's a thing. You know, you don't want people looking at it as a brand. You want it to be everybody's. It's a gift to the world. Your category name should be utilitarian. People want to use it. So you never throw a trademark symbol on it. And as soon as you can get others to start talking about it, as she said, in in the ecosystem, your partners get other people co-marketing and using that same term. That's the winner right there. Get get people to use it. Uh, to define uh, their new categories, do you recommend that entrepreneurs put much of their energy towards building their personal brand or personal domain authority versus you know defining the new category with thought leadership that only comes from you know within the business brand itself? Yeah, <clears throat> if if a, if a category um, if a category point of view is done properly, and the category name is one that makes sense to that category, and everyone in the company is is living, breathing the category, and I mean that almost. And this is going to sound crazy, but almost in a religious way, you want everybody beating their chest to the category drum. If you do that then the personal, you know, your, your, your comment about the personal um, branding and that, that all is going to start to take shape. And, you know, where, um, you know, you look through a company and it, there's, there's companies in New York City that still wear suits to work, believe it or not, in the, you know, financial industry. But if you go across the street to the, um, to the software company, everyone there has jeans and T-shirts. Well, that's the culture they've built. And that culture is based on their point of view. And if the point of view within the company includes the category story, then everybody's blue jeans are going to start to be oriented around the category. They're going to be, you know, tight ankle hugging blue jeans, for instance, and it supports the category and, and using a crazy metaphor, but basically the, the point of view and the category should influence everybody's personal brand. But then everybody's personal brand is going to be their own as well. 
So you, you want to intertwine it into your culture. Final question here as we reach the top of the hour. Um, you know, this is for me. So, okay, we buy it. This is this is what we want to do. We're super pumped up about category design now. Everybody here in the chat room, everyone that's going to watch this on replay. Um, you know, what's the what what's the one thing I should do this weekend um, to kind of get the ball rolling on this? Like, what's the one thing I should start with? It's exactly what we do when we start a new project with a client. So I would tell tell everybody the first thing to do, and I know a lot of you have already done it, is read Play Bigger. Second thing to do is make sure that all of your team that's important to you, your inner core team, your co-founders, maybe a key investor, have them read Play Bigger. Once you've done that and you've got category thinking you know, embedded in your mind, then ask yourself, and this is in the book, so you can go dig it up, Dave's three questions. It's a very simple exercise. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> when we work um, on a project with a client, our very first day is actually talking about Dave's three questions almost the whole day. And Dave's three questions are, what is the problem you're solving? Make sure you understand that to the nth degree. If you solve this problem, what would the category be? And you should be able to identify the category. And then if you, you solve that cat with if you solve the problem with the category, how big can that category be? And that's an economic question. And those simple three questions can provide you with a lot of thinking that'll lead you towards realizing a category exists. And then once you realize the category exists, then you can start doing the real work, which is What's the perfect name for the category? What's the perfect point of view to tell the story? And by the way, the category name might not come to you until you're done the point of view and you're already talking about it to people. And the category name might be changed by the, by the people that you bring the story to. Don't let the category name get you bogged down. Make the point of view your highest priority. How do you identify the problem? How do you talk about the solution? And that's the category. Amazing. That was that was terrific. And I'm already seeing some people uh, in the chat room that are thankful for this. Mike, thank you so much for doing this for our community. This has been terrific. We've all learned a lot. This was a great discussion. This is some of the highest level of engagement we've had on one of these sessions. So, you know, um, this has been just great. So thank you so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, and I'm looking forward to speaking with you soon. Yeah, thank you so much. And to all the audience, um, the contact info that's on the screen there, um, we have no problem um, chit-chatting about category topics at any time. Um, so whether you're one one founder in, in a basement or you're already up to 50 people, either way, reach out. We Categories are is what we do every day. Perfect. Thank you so much. And with that, we're going to adjourn here. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good rest of your week and your weekend. Goodbye.